So I get to talk about the really exciting stuff in these slides, and that's the whole evolution of the architecture and, and the platform that sits behind um, Course Switch 1. Um, it's a bit of a dry subject, so I'm going to try and make it as interesting as I possibly can, um, not helped by some dry slides, uh, certainly to start with. So, you know, we've got to the Course Switch 1 platform through actually seven different iterations of platform over actually seven years, and the timeline wasn't one platform one year, but it was seven different iterations, and, and you know, that started with an asterisk solution combined with Camaleo. Um, if you guys, are, if anybody's tech in this room, you'll all know Asterix, but you might not know Camaleo as a SIP proxy. Um, but we started with that. That was pretty decent, did what we needed to do, but had lots of limitations. You know, it didn't support WebRTC when we wanted it to support WebRTC. It didn't support the Opus Colac, the 8K instead of the 80K uh, bit rate that, that uh, Opus manages uh, to let us all enjoy. Um, you know, it had lots of limitations to it, and it certainly didn't scale. It's designed for this something that's kind of single tenant type installation. Um, so we started with Asterix Camaleo, that didn't work too well, or as well as we wanted it to work, so then we went Asterix OpenSips. Well, that didn't work too well either, you know, we thought OpenSips would scale a bit better than Camaleo, and it did, but not to the level that we wanted it to. But it, it was performing, so we thought, right, we'll stick with that, but we're still not happy with Asterix. You know, we actually think there's a better solution in FreeSwitch. So then we moved to a FreeSwitch OpenSip stack. Again, that didn't scale in the way that we wanted to, to build a proper C++ platform. Um, so we then moved on from that. We started saying, okay, well, where's the bit that's restricting the scale? Well, actually, the restriction was coming at free, from FreeSwitch at that time. Um, so we replaced FreeSwitch with what, what we called internally Galaxy. It was our own version of FreeSwitch, if you like. Um, but OpenSips was scaling quite nicely. So that works, and that did actually work for a good number of years, a nice scalable platform. It was working um, to, to how we wanted it to at the time. Could it handle the throughput we were starting to see? No, we were starting to see it creak a little bit. Um, so we moved on from that. To, uh, to Galaxy and TARDIS. So now we have our own complete platform. Okay, so this iteration four or five, I think we might be on now. Um, Galaxy and TARDIS <coughs> became our own asterisk stroke free switch, and TARDIS became our own SIP proxy, replacing Command and Open SIP. So at this point, we are now running our completely own architecture, and we've been dead happy with that, and this was the product that actually has been out there um, for quite some time. But we thought we'd do one better. And that was around resilience, actually. Um, at this point, we had a product that could scale wonderfully. You could add 100,000 users, no worries. Um, it was self-healing in so many different parts of the platform. If we lost, lost a server over here, no worries. If we lost a server over here, no worries. The one part that wasn't quite perfect yet was that if we lost a server mid-call, and your call was taking place on that server, you would redial and be connected to another part of the platform afterwards. And that's very common. That's common with Asterix and Freeze, which is what we're all used to. So I really think we have something unique with that. And we've called that Nebula. Uh, so the Nebula platform is the platform that sits behind Yay, and it's also the platform that now sits behind the Call Switch 1 product that you're seeing today. So it's the platform that we're talking about here. Um, Nebula basically consists of, of, if you like, three parts. Okay? And these three parts are spread across hundreds of servers. Okay? So it's not, it's not just three servers that run Nebula for each tenant. We don't have this concept of tenants, we have this concept of user. You, know, you come on the platform as a user, you're on the user, you're attached to this customer who's attached to this partner, who's attached to uh, this provider right at the top for want of better words. And we, we, we generally break it down into three parts, the Nebula proxy, the Nebula switchboard, and then the media servers um, that, are, that are, if you like, controlling the voice um, conversation. The proxy being that interaction with SIP, and we all, I'm sure, uh, love SIP, and we'll talk a little bit more about what we do with that, because that's quite unique. Um, the switchboard being the clever stuff, you know, the IVR routing, the call cues, the monitor this person, whisper in their ear, all the things that you might experience right now with both the contact center product and the non-contact center product. And then Nebula Media being that load balancing all those voice packets, you know, what's happening with the actual voice conversation, making sure the quality is very good, et cetera, et cetera. Sat below all of that is, of course, a database core that's vital. You know, databases sit behind everything. Um, why I wanted to speak to this point specifically is we've been really quite clever with that. So we use um, Cockroach as a database. Um, if you don't know about Cockroach, it's from the Google Spanner team, um, which is a, a database that I think lots of people have heard of. Um, it's, not, it's not sat on a MySQL database as, as you might know and might, might have, you know, 
see commonly in, in Asterix and in FreeSwitch. Um, your cockroach is genuinely the world's only truly read-write database. So uh, in a normal database architecture, we would write to probably one or two servers, or we'd read actually from, from lots of servers, but we'd write to one or two. And then behind the scenes, we would be making all that data you know, sync between all the servers so quickly that you don't even know what's going on. That's quite a traditional database model. In the case of Cockroach, we generally write to all of them at the same time. And that latency is non-existent. So we have a very big customer in Australia, actually, um, that's a new customer um, through Telco Switch um, that actually uh, you know, sees no latency whatsoever um, in their calling, yet they're based in Australia. So it's truly global. Sat above that, um, is, a, is a memory cache layer. So a database architecture that's sat in memory of a, of a heap of servers. And we use a combination of uh, KeyDB and Redis for that, if anybody's heard of those names. Redis is one that, you, that some people have heard of, maybe not KeyDB, KeyDB. But we load balance between the two of those because actually Redis still has some weaknesses even though it's so common and, and so does KeyDB. So we don't want to be exposed to, to any one or the other at any one time. And that memory layer means that we get access to data incredibly quick. So when we're making a call, or your customers are making a call, and we need to do 60 different database calls to check that they're allowed to dial that number, that we're recording the, the, the entry that the call started, that are they a fraudulent customer, are they not? There's, there's over 60 checks that we actually do. We're able to do that incredibly quickly. So the post delay dial is almost non-existent from our side. There may be some post delay dial from, say, the mobile network you're connecting into. But from our side, that latency is absolutely negligible. So we've got this fantastic database sat below, but actually the bits that really count are all held in cache, and they're super fast and, and rapid access. And that's not just at the start of the call, it's, it's throughout the call. So the whole infrastructure isn't running on our own metal. The whole infrastructure is running on Google Cloud Services, or GCS as it's commonly referred to. And what that gives us is a huge platform resilience. I think in five or six years of being in Google Cloud, we've had one or two outages that have been Google Cloud related, and at the same time as us being off, Spotify's been off, Snapchat's been off, HSBC's been off, all these other great enterprise customers that are running on Google Cloud. So it really is a, a rock solid infrastructure. I should add that we started the, the, these whole platform innovations in our own data centers. So we had our own ASNs, we were running our own network, we were doing everything you would expect us to do. And actually it was the younger kids in the business that came in and said, right, before we roll out that next DC, can I maybe load balance that with AWS? Oh, yeah, let's try it. Well, that didn't work too well. Okay, let's try and load balance it with GCS. Oh, that worked really well. You know, a year later, why on earth are we still running our own metal? You know, and a several million pound investment in infrastructure, we literally wrote off because it made so much more sense to have an infrastructure that we could just click up and down and scale as we need. If we want to bring on a new server with Google Cloud, we can do it in seconds, not days. So everything's running on Google Cloud, and of course, you know, Nebula isn't running on a single server, it's running on a whole platform of servers. So your calls and your, your, um, your users and your call routes and every different part of what you guys are doing with our platform will be running across the entire platform. There's no more you're on MT106 and we've got a problem with MT103 or actually this server is happening, with, with, you know, we're doing this with this server and we're doing this with that server. It's just users, you're just adding users to the platform and that platform is, will just work. And that is the, that is the evolution of Call Switch 1. Now I'm sure you're all listening thinking, yeah that's great Matt, you know, brilliant, you're selling the dream, you know, that's what I really want. Um, but how does that dream actually scale? So I thought I'd give you a, a few charts. Um, it's, a, it's a really common question. Now, in this particular chart, and I put these charts together myself actually, um, we took this just off a sample of six servers. It doesn't really matter whether we take it off a sample of six or a sample of 600, it's to give you the, the concept really. So if we take just the SIP proxy part of Nebula, what this is showing you, I think we're showing three servers in that particular SIP proxy, but what we're showing you there is over a period of time, each server is consistent in its CPU usage. That means we can scale. Because the servers are consistent. So it's all I've got to do is keep an eye on this, and yet we're running at 30% of CPU capacity. And as a general rule, we run up to about 60, sometimes to 80% at peak, but we like to keep it nice and low. So across our whole cluster at this time, and bear in mind this is only a sample of three servers, 
we were running at 30% of CPU capacity. Okay, so next week we've added another 100,000 users, now we're running at 40% capacity. Next week, oh, now we're running at 50% capacity. Bring more online, we drop it back to 30% again. The fact is, they're running evenly across all of those servers. And that proves the ability to scale. That's the really important part of this. Same can be said of the media core. So where we're handling that core traffic, a lot more CPU intensive. I've taken six servers here. You can see, as you would expect, as, as core traffic ramps up, so does the CPU requirements. They dip a little bit around lunch. They peak again in the afternoon, and they drop off through the day. So there were peak CP usage at this time of 60%, and I think there were six servers in this example. But the bit that you need to care about here again is that every one of those servers has got an identical CPU pattern. So the scalability is there. When we get that to 65 70%, we bring on more load. That drops it back down to 50%, and obviously we're monitoring that 24-7. We're able to bring that infrastructure up and down. What we're not doing at the moment um, and it's a conversation I have constantly internally, it frustrates me, is that during the night we're not dropping the capacity at all actually. Um, and we probably should, because we've, we've still got the same peak capacity running through the night, but yet we haven't got the same peak usage. But we don't do that right now, we've got the same infrastructure um, all the time. The point, and I can't stress it enough, of what you're looking at here, is that the identical patterns of these CPUs, that is what means scale. That's what means we scale out very, very easily. Um, to put that into some kind of stats that, that you, know, you might be familiar with, cores per second and CPU efficiency. And why I'm showing these two charts next to the two relevant uh, line graphs on the left is because cores per second is something we care about on the SIP proxy only. The setup of that call, that handshake, you know, when, when we're trying to establish a call between a client and us. You know, when the desk phone is trying to talk to us, when they say, hello, I'm here, I'd like to call the number. Um, I'm using the OPEX codec, if you haven't got that, and then I want G711, if you haven't got that, then I, you know, I want this, and by the way, I'm trying to call user one. <coughs> that, that's an intense conversation that goes on. So that ability um, to, to, to set up those calls per second is, is really important. And what the chart on the right is basically showing you is that actually the technology we've built gets more efficient the more you throw at it. So the efficiency of those calls per second gets better as we get into the peaks of the morning and the afternoon. So whilst it's sitting on idle, actually it's not, it, you know, it, it's not as efficient. But once it gets going like a good athlete, it can run, you know, it can run a full marathon. And it's the same thing really with CPU efficiency over time on the media core. Again, similar challenges there. The CPU is really intensified. Once all the coals start ramping up, can we handle that? Can we manage it? Yes, we can. And you can see that in that chart there. So I wanted to show you guys that stuff so that you could actually see some of our inner workings um, and why this tech stack is so innovative. You know, it generally will allow you to put 100,000 users on tomorrow. There is no build time for those 100,000 users. It generally will allow you to pick one of a million numbers, all 456, I think there's one missing um, area codes across the UK with a selection in most cases of over 5,000 numbers, London excluded, we all know that's a challenge. Um, as well as lots of international numbering as well. All clicked by, done, it's there. 